Hi, this is our presentation for VUS 105 GBA. I'm Yixing from T01 and my group members are Cheryl, Joey, Divika and Daryl. The objective of this research is to find out the relationship between the influence of social media and students' academic performance. Over the years, the advancements in technology has resulted in the increased accessibility to internet, which then led to the increase in usage of social media. In this information age, social media have become increasingly popular, especially among the young adults. Thus, parents and teachers are concerned if the usage of social media would affect students' academic performance. For the purpose of this study, social media will be limited to the following social networking sites. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, and Tumblr. Therefore, the hypothesis for this study is that there is a relationship between the student's academic performance and their level of usage of social media. The research requires the collection and the analysis of primary data. We posted a survey online and invited a cohort of UNISIM students to participate in our survey. The survey was administered during the first two weeks of February and a total of 51 responses were collected. The dependent variable of the survey is the academic performance of the student, indicated by his or her GPA. The independent variable is the level of usage of social media, indicated by namely the hours spent using the social media in a day, the perceived dependability of the student on social media, and the type of social media being used, whether it can be used for academic purposes or purely for entertainment. Moving on, we'll be covering our descriptive statistics. The figures that we have generated from our survey results are the breakdown of their cumulative GPA, the time spent on social media daily, and the scale for their dependability on social media. We have found out that the sample mean of the exact GPA is 3.86471. The sample mean has advantages when making inferences about a population mean. The sample median for the exact GPA is 3.9. It is the measure for the central tendency. As there are very few outliers found in this result, the mean and the median are around the same value. The mean is usually sensitive to extreme values. However, in this case, it is not really influenced by outliers as the standard deviation is relatively small. The sample mode is a value that occurs most commonly. The mode indicates that most of the students had a GPA of 3.9. The standard deviation for the exact GPA is 0 0.23309. A large standard deviation indicates the data points are far from the mean, and a smaller standard deviation indicates they are clustered closely around the mean. The spread of data for our exact GPA is relatively small, which shows that the data are around the mean and there is lesser variability of the data. When the mean is less than the median, the distribution has a negative skew. Hence, the relationship being observed here is a negative correlation. We can make use of correlation and regression to analyze the results of our survey. Correlation and regression consists of the scatter plot and the R value. The scatter plot shows the relationship between two different variables by displaying data points plotted on a two dimensional graph. Our report makes use of a few independent variables, and thus we have more than one scatter plot. After plotting our linear model using regression analysis, we have to determine how closely the model fits the data. The closer R is to plus 1 or minus 1, the stronger the correlation between the two variables. The closer R is to 0, the weaker the relationship between X and Y. R square, or the coefficient of determination, is a statistical measure of how close the data is to the fitted regression line. R square is always a positive value. It tells us what percent of x describes what happened to y. The closer R square is to 1, the better x explains y. However, the disadvantage of using R square is that it cannot determine whether coefficients and predictions are biases. For most of our scatter plots, the calculated R square value is close to 0, indicating that there is little correlation between our independent variables and dependent variable. However, for the scatter plot of GPA of student against level of usage of social media that can be used for academic purposes, the R-square value is 0 0.5, indicating that there is some sort of correlation between the two variables. This might be able to explain certain outliers in the scatter plot of the student's GPA against hours of social media used in a day, that even though the student spends many hours online, he or she might be doing productive or informative things which could explain why they still attain high GPAs. After correlation and regression analysis, we begin the five-step hypothesis testing process. A hypothesis is defined as an unverified statement about a population parameter, and the first two steps especially helps us discover differences between a hypothesis and actual findings. We begin step one by stating the null and alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a statement about the value of a population parameter that we attempt to disprove or fail to reject. However, if we, even if we do not reject the null hypothesis based on our sample data findings, we cannot say that failing to reject means the h null is true. We have established that the null hypothesis is that the mean number of hours spent on social media will not 
cannot be more than four hours daily. Step two involves the stating of the level of significance alpha, which refers to the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. We decided to go with a 0.05 level as it better reflects the user research nature of our project. Out of 200 Unisim students, we selected a random sample of 50 students for testing. In the sample, 6 students, all 12% exceeded 4 hours of social media usage daily. These outliers showed little to no correlation between their GPAs and social media usage. The sample was rejected because it exceeded our predetermined maximum limit of 5%. If the sample was if the sample including the six students actually showed no correlation between their social media usage and their GPAs, then the decision to reject the survey findings would be correct. However, if the six students were the only ones showing no correlation in the population of 200 students, then only six out of 200 or 3% of the population showed no correlation. In this case, less than 5% of the students showed no correlation and making it a type 1 error to reject the findings. It is pertinent to note that other than the aforementioned type 1 error, we may also have committed a type 2 error if we had not rejected the null hypothesis when it is false. For instance, if we had interviewed two out of five students and, obje and observed a strong correlation between their GPAs and social media usage, we would have accepted the findings as 40% or more than 5% showed strong correlation. It could purely be a coincidental sample bias that two students selected in the sample were the only ones in the cohort which showed a strong correlation. Retrospectively, a researcher cannot study every single data node in a population. Therefore, it is crucial we remain conscious of the two types of errors, type 1 and type 2 errors. The following table summarizes all the decisions we could have undertaken. This concludes our statistical and inferential analysis of the correlation between the Unisim students' GPA and their usage of social media. It surfaces the exciting characteristics of probability studies where one will always be subjected to sampling bias when attempting to find a definitive correlation of population parameters.